quick housekeeping items. Please note that the session is being recorded and we'll make the recording available to you afterwards. Uh, please use the chat functionality to submit any questions as you've been doing throughout the webinar series. I'd also like to send a reminder for those that are joining us for the first time. Please note that this is an interactive webinar where we will have short polling questions throughout. So we really do look forward to your inputs. And again, as I mentioned, the material that we've provided and, and we'll be going over today, that recording will be available uh, after the presentation as with the rest of the series. Great, ready to move on then. Um, we're very, very excited to welcome back as our key Maya presenter today, Richard Ozaki. So Richard is a thermal engineer with Siemens Digital Industry Software. He has over a decade of experience when it comes to understanding the Siemens and, and Mentor Graphics tools. He's an electronic specialist, uh, thermal consultant, and has also provided training. We're very happy to have Richard back with us here today for this presentation. Some of you that were here on the earlier sessions may have heard from him as well. So he will be bringing us through the majority of the technical content. Great, we're ready to move on. A quick introduction as well. My name is Daniel Mazar. I have the pleasure of being your host for this webinar and throughout the series. So I'm responsible for customer success and, and sales operations for Maya in North America, where I'm leveraging my electrical engineering background to support Maya's customers throughout the US and Canada. And a quick note, as, as I mentioned, Maya HTT is hosting this webinar series, and Maya is the leading provider of digital engineering solutions and the top global partner for Siemens digital industry software. Maya started out with a strong history in aerospace, but has been working throughout multiple industries on complex engineering challenges through design, simulation, and PLM software over the last three decades. So lots of cutting edge challenges and that we've been helping address. Very excited with the work that we do. In particular, there's immense growth around the challenges related to electrification and electronics cooling. And so we're, we're happy to be discussing that today. Just moving on real quick, uh, I'll, I'll allude to this as I have with the other presentations. So Maya, while we're only going over a small portion today in terms of the, the presentation, what we wanted to also address is there's a lot more to Maya and what we offer than what you're seeing. So if you have areas of interest uh, in, related to manufacturing, you know, automation optimization, any kind of custom dev related work, if you're curious about even understanding or, or helping us analyze your workflows in relation to what's best case in industry and in practice we're happy to set up conversations around that as well so please don't hesitate to get in touch we just wanted to make sure you're aware of what else is out there so with that i think we're ready to get started as i mentioned today is, is the fourth and last session for us uh, in terms of the series and i think we're ready to move on to the next slide just as we make that introduction and with that i'm going to pass over to richard who will bring us through thermal testing and validation off to you richard all right thanks dan so yeah good morning good afternoon everyone so this is the last session part four and today we're going to be talking about thermal test and validation as it relates to electronics so up to this point we've talked a little bit about you know some of the background theory on electronics cooling and then we've applied that to modeling um, the ic packages okay the actual chips that we see on electronic systems then we talked about how to model and simulate PCBs, the printed circuit boards, um, which is the most important part of the electronic system. And then today we're going to round that out with actually how to test electronic systems. Okay, And we'll introduce some of the concepts some new products and uh, how we think we should be doing it here at Siemens. So, uh, oh, I've actually I just talked about this slide. So uh, in this one, uh, I do have an agenda here. So. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is junction temperature measurement. So if we if we think back to the first session where we talked about electronics cooling fundamentals, we, we discussed the concept of a junction temperature. So the junction temperature is the actual silicon temperature, the actual semiconductor temperature within the package. It's no good measuring the outside temperature of a component. We really need to know what the semiconductor temperature is. And that's very difficult because it's surrounded by lots of other mechanical enclosures and, and and parts so it's, it's tricky to get that temperature then we'll talk about thermal resistances and thermal capacitance capacitance uh, capacitances okay and what structure functions are and the heat flow path out of a device uh, and then we'll talk about how we can use that structure function to you know extract things like thermal metrics how we can use it to calibrate package models use it in thermal reliability and quality assessment 
All right. So with that, let's let's get started. So talking a little bit about the current market drivers in electronics, there, there's four main things I just want to touch on uh, that's really starting to, uh, just starting to explode, really. So the first one is 5G wireless network deployment. We're starting to see the infrastructure in 5G. It's still it's still trickling down. We're going to start to see it really ramp up, you know, as as we uh, as people adopt this technology. But 5G is a lot more power intensive due to the uh, the much higher bandwidth required for mobile devices. And you know, we're not just going to see 5G in mobile phones. We're going to start to see it integrated into laptops, into cars, into IoT devices for transmitting a lot more data at a lot higher rate. Uh, governments are also focusing on uh, renewable energy, okay, wind and solar. That requires a lot of semiconductors to um, invert and convert that power uh, to, satisfy, to satisfy the grid requirements. Uh, electric vehicles, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. Uh, we're seeing a lot of government targets for adoption of electric vehicles. Manufacturers are committing to phasing out internal combustion engines as well. Okay, and then businesses using IoT technologies, making um, dumb components in your factories smarter. You know, even simple things like valves. What's the flow rate? What's the position? Heat exchangers. If, if we can extract that data and present it using IoT devices, we can get a lot more insight. Uh, and again, that's going to be relying on semiconductors, 5G, uh, and wireless protocols as well. And with, you know, if we look at uh, consumption of semiconductors per person in China uh, in 2010 versus 2020, there's a huge increase there uh, as people are buying more and more gadgets with, uh, with semiconductors in them. Okay, so automotive is one of the major market drivers. So the thing about automotive is, you know, you might expect your phone to last two to two to five years, okay, your, your iPhone in your pocket, two to five years is a typical operating range. Your laptop, again, you might keep for two to five years, even your TV in your, in your front room, again, maybe uh, three to seven years, something like that. With automotive, you're going to be expecting that car to be on the road for maybe even 20 plus years, okay, and with some of the more complex systems on board, the ADAS, Advanced Driver Assistance, uh, systems, you know, lane keep assist, um, automatic uh, cruise control, even autonomous driving, that requires huge computational power and uh, heat dissipation, and that's got to last 20 plus years. It's got to be designed very robustly. There's got to be a lot of redundancy, and it's got to be very, very reliable. Okay, so uh, the semiconductor content of electric vehicles is exploding. Um, thousands of components within the coming years. There's a high pressure on pricing and standardization across manufacturers uh, and, you know, electric, uh, the semiconductors within uh, a vehicle are, are going to cost up to 30% of, uh, sorry, uh, electric vehicles are going to account for 30% of car sales by, by 2030. If we have a look at where those semiconductors are actually being used in electric vehicles, then you can see this big green section is the inverters. Okay, so when you uh, convert the uh, 400 volts of a battery pack to three-phase AC for, uh, for driving the actual motors, then that's where a majority of the, uh, the, the big expensive semiconductors are. Um, we also have things like battery monitoring systems, okay? So even when the vehicle's parked, you need to make sure the batteries are kept at a, a very steady temperature, and that's achieved through heater packs or fans or other cooling and heating mechanisms there to, to maintain range and again lifetime over those 20 years. So we're going to start to see semiconductors really explode in electric vehicles. And then on the right hand side we're starting to see some of the, the technologies for semiconductors. Okay, Up to now it's mostly been silicon. Silicon is by far the most um, uh, broadly used semiconductor you know in any uh, a computer that you, you might open, you'll find silicon semiconductors in there. But we're starting to see silicon carbide uh, make a larger appearance in electric vehicles and also gallium nitride as well. They, they do have their various pros and cons, but uh, silicon carbide is starting to uh, take more and more market share. And it's very 
useful in certain applications, especially the inverter, high voltage, high switching speed applications. So all that is to say, semiconductor usage is exploding. And as it explodes, we need to make sure that they're kept as cool as possible. The number one failure mode mechanism for electronics is temperature with 55%. With this, uh, this is a survey or uh, a report by the US Air Force. Why do electronics fail? It's temperature and vibration. You know, that accounts for three quarters of electronics failures out there. Um, and you know, if, if a component gets too hot, there's a performance loss. Uh, and especially in electric vehicle applications, that's simply not allowed to happen. That can end up with cars on the side of the road due to, due to failed, uh, uh, failed electronics. Even with redundancy, um, you know, the, the core operation of that vehicle just might stop working if they get too hot. Um, and that's also related to reliability as well. As, as the junction temperature gets hotter and hotter, then the failures, the failure rates go up and up. You know, with, with silicon, we're talking maybe 120 degrees C. Uh, with silicon carbide, you can go higher, but uh, at some point the chips will burn out, and then, uh, especially in vehicles, it's very expensive uh, to to swap those out and and to repair those uh, burnt out semiconductors. It normally means you know removing whole boards or whole modules and swapping those out. Again, very expensive. So high temperature components have a very high possibility to fail. We need to keep those cool as possible to, to maintain reliability of our systems. Okay, so let's talk about junction temperature measurement um, and thermal transient testing. We call this TTT or T3, okay? Um, and we're gonna talk about electrical test methods and the structure function. So historically, uh, some more conventional ways of measuring temperature, there's thermocouples out there, okay, thermocouples, there's IR cameras, both relatively cheap to implement, okay, but they, they have their drawbacks. Um, thermocouples, when you, uh, they can only measure surface temperatures. When you attach them to a surface, they can actually influence the temperature in that, in that localized area and give you a, um, a slight offset from the actual temperature as if, if it had been undisturbed, okay? Um, thermocouples can be large. They can actually conduct heat away from a, a surface and, uh, you know, um, alter the reading is what I'm trying to get at here. Um, IR cameras, again, cheap, but the issue is, again, you're only getting surface temperature measurements and you need to do a lot of prep to get uh, accurate IR camera readings. Um, for instance, you need to increase the surface emissivity to as close as one as possible. You can do that by treating electronics with a certain powder to you know, increase radiation. Um, and if you're not doing that, you're not going to get the correct temperature. And again, you're only getting the surface temperature of the electronics, uh, which, which is, is not what we want. We want the junction temperature, which is this, um, let me just, uh, where are we going? Let's go to laser pointer. So we actually want the junction temperature, the silicon temperature inside the package. And we don't know that because the IR camera can only measure the surface. So, what we're proposing is a new electrical test measure method called thermal transient testing. Okay, so a little bit of the theory here. So the forward voltage of a PN junction of a semiconductor can be used as a very accurate thermometer. Okay, so here's an electric circuit and we have our semiconductor here, here's a diode, and we're forcing a certain amount of current through this circuit. And if we measure the voltage across this semiconductor, this changes with temperature. So, and, and it, it changes in a very reliable linear way, okay? And we call this change in temperature the temperature sensitive parameter. And we can calibrate that over a range of temperatures, okay? So let's say this is a, uh, an Intel CPU in your, in your PC and we can attach a cold plate to that and heat soak that device at say 20, 40, 60, 80, all the way up to 120 degrees, and then measure the temperature across that device, okay? And based on the voltage 
change versus temperature, what we're doing is we're calibrating that device and taking very, very accurate voltage measurements and then translating that to temperature. Okay, because we've heat soaked that device, we can be confident that because the whole device is at that single uh, isotherm temperature. And we can use this calibration curve to then measure the voltage later and say, ah, it's 600 millivolts, so it must be at 80 degrees C. Okay, very simple in practice. Uh, sorry, very simple in theory. In practice, it's a lot trickier, um, especially when it comes to um, turning current on and off um, and measuring that voltage versus time, which we'll talk about next. Okay, so how is the measurement done? So it's the static test mesh method is defined by JEDEC 51-1, okay? And what we do is we switch between two power states very quickly. Uh, we're talking sub-microsecond here. Um, so we go from a high power, let's say 100, 100 watts of power, down to say 0.1 watt of power, okay? So we know what the power change is, okay? And then as soon as we drop that power to the low power level, we start our voltage slash temperature measurement versus time, okay? And we can, you know, we can measure time in very, very, time and temperature in very, very small increments. So down to one microsecond, and the resolution is about 0 0.01 degrees C. Um, and it uses the four wire setup, so we have, very high power, high current um, lines going to the device, and then very low power, low current uh, sensing lines, which are actually doing the measurement of the voltage itself, okay? And we get a curve, something like this, okay? So time versus temperature, and you can see the curve goes up, but it's not that kind of typical S curve because we've got that very small time measurement, we get a curve like this, and this, gives us a lot of information about the heat flow out of that device. Okay, at this point, let's uh, put up poll question number one, please, Dan. That should be coming up just in a moment. So it should be on your screens now. And again, this in this case, you can select multiple options based on what you think applies most. So have you performed any thermal physical testing on electronics. There's a couple options here. So thermocouples, IR camera, electrical test methods, or none. If you could just, we'll give another few seconds as, as you just fill out your responses. Again, there is no right answer. We're just trying to gauge what would be relevant to you as, as we move forward. And Richard can also provide some comments on what he's seeing in industry. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. Just to share the results for everyone to see. So 27% saying none in terms of any kind of thermal physical testing. Uh, a little bit indicative and, and hopefully that's where some value could be derived. Um, but 67% of our audience who filled out saying that yes, they do some, they do thermal couples in terms of testing. Um, and also 47% talk about how they do IR camera with a smaller subset of 17% doing electrical test methods. So Richard, if you could comment on that and also take us away from here. So I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll and pass it back to you, Richard. All right, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I'm not surprised by that. You know, thermocouples and IR cameras, it, it's cheap, it's quick, it gives you a rough guideline. Um, you know, if you're not too concerned with absolute accuracy, they're absolutely fine. You know, if you're doing comparative studies, the deltas between power states or deltas between different designs of heatsink, for example, thermocouples are, are absolutely fine. Um, it's really when you need to get that critical junction temperature and monitor that, especially if you're close to the maximum operating conditions, then that, that's when electrical test methods are, are really come into their own because you really get that accuracy, uh, not just the temperature, but also the time versus temperature. Okay, I'm gonna move on. And okay, so let's talk next about thermal resistance versus thermal capacitance profiles. So we've done that electrical test, we've 
measured the transient response as we go from a high power to a low power state, what kind of information does that give us and how can we use that? Okay, and we'll be talking about the structure function next. So very quickly, let's go back and review um, what conduction is and what it's uh, dominated by. So conduction uh, is dominated by Fourier's law. It's, it's uh, you know, this is kind of a fundamental of, of uh, thermodynamics. So you have a surface area, you have a thickness, and the material property which, which defines it is the thermal conductivity, measured in watts per meter Kelvin. As you push a certain amount of heat through a material, there will be a certain thermal resistance, which is defined um, by the, uh, the, the sample size and the thermal conductivity. Now, um, certain materials have much higher thermal conductivity. Copper is around 400 watts per meter Kelvin, um, but then some thermoplastics like um, polystyrene, um, acrylic, ABS, they're all sub one watt per meter Kelvin, closer to 0.2 actually. So there's a very large range of thermal conductivity, several orders of magnitude difference, um, and that's going to have a large effect on how well or how poorly heat is conducted through a material. Uh, again, just to recap on session two, we'll talk about semiconductor packaging. Okay, what is a semiconductor package? Well, the actual semiconductor is only the chip. This is the silicon inside of the package. If you open your phone or you open your PC, you'll see these little black squares on the board. That's not the chip. The chip is the very small piece of silicon actually inside that little square. And a semiconductor package has a few different purposes. Um, first of all, it's mechanical, okay? It needs to protect and support the chip. It needs to stop moisture, stress, contamination, and shock from getting to that very fragile uh, IC, the actual chip itself, okay? Secondly, uh, the package is there to supply an electrical connection. Okay, interconnect from the silicon to the PCB through the leads, there's wire bonds, uh, there's the, the lead frame, there could be a, a ground pad in there, but we're, we're essentially transmitting electrical signals uh, to and from the die and it's performing some sort of logic and, and returning a result. Okay, and then thirdly, thermal management, which is what I'm most interested in, is conducting heat out of the package. Okay, important thing to note here is conduction. There is no air in there. There is no radiative heat transfer within the package itself. It's all conduction, okay? The, silica, uh, the, the, the semiconductor itself is normally silicon. The resin is normally some sort of epoxy overmold. The leads can be a copper alloy or aluminum, and the bond wires are typically gold, okay? So there's a whole different amalgamation of different materials in here, and they're gonna be transferring heat out at different rates based on their thermal conductivity, okay? And there's two dominant paths that heat can uh, escape out of a package, and that's down into the PCB, okay? Conducting it down towards the, where it's electrically connected, or up through the heat sink. So if this package had some sort of heat sink on the top, then that would be the most dominant heat transfer uh, mode. But but those two are, are, are the most important ones. You, you do get a little bit out the sides, but it's normally touching air, so it's normally negligible. So PCB and heatsink are the most important. And you can see a few different package types. It really depends on what your application is as to what package type you would be using. Okay. Uh, and just to recap one more, one further thing is the concept of thermal resistance as it applies to packages, okay? So here's a chip on a board, for example, and uh, within the chip, there will be a, a, a semiconductor package. That's the junction temperature that we want, to, uh, we want to know in as much detail as possible. And if we want to know what the thermal resistance of a package is, the, the calculation is very simple. Okay, junction to reference is going to be the delta T divided by the power that is supplied to that device. Okay, and it's measured in degrees C per watt. So if you want to measure the junction to ambient, you just do junction temperature minus ambient temperature divided by the power that you've supplied. Okay, and there's multiple different 
thermal resistances that you can you can define like junction to case or junction to board junction to ambient these are all different thermal resistances that serve different purposes when it comes to thermal calculations all right so um now that we've covered all of that uh, theory uh, and just reminded you of some of those things um, let's now apply that to package thermal metrics Okay, so here we have a simple high power transistor. This is called the TO220 package. And we'd like to understand how heat conducts out of this package. So here's our die, this is our silicon. Okay, this is inside of the package, looks like this. And the actual silicon itself does not heat up uniformly. There's something called an active area, an active surface where the actual transistors are, are placed on the actual uh, semiconductor itself okay then there is a die attached this is normally like an epoxy or some sort of glue which attaches it to the die flag okay this is the, uh, the, the, the the sort of the the heat sink base as it will of this particular package okay? the, the the die attaches there to mechanically attach but also electrically isolate as well so it's a dielectric uh, part not always but but most of the time Okay, so as heat spreads down, there's going to be a thermal resistance associated with the silicon material, the dye attached material, and then the dye flag material. Okay, there will also be a thermal capacitance. Okay, based on the size and the volume of each of these parts, there will be a certain, you know, thermal mass. It, it, it takes time to heat soak this. Uh, each of these different materials uh, and the temperature changing versus time can can give us that information. Okay, so thermal resistance, thermal capacitance as the heat travels through a material. And as the heat travels through that material, it, it doesn't go in a 1D path. It actually spreads. As you go from a point source, there will be this kind of conic spreading of that heat as it goes through those various different materials okay and again that can be captured with our thermal resistances and capacitances as it spreads through the various device uh, various materials in a device okay um, so you can see here this is a cross section of a, a slightly different package but you can see the isotherms here the junction the active surface of the, the silicon is at maybe 80 degrees. And as it spreads, you get this conical spreading through the device. You have the die, die attach, copper base. You might have a grease. You might have a cold plate. And you get these rings of isotherms as the heat spreads through the device, as it encounters these thermal resistances and thermal capacitances to the source of lower temperature, because heat will always flow towards a lower temperature. Okay, so we're taking this heat map and basically turning it into a series of resistances and capacitances that the, that the, that the heat experiences, and, and we can use that transiently, as we'll see in just a second. Hopefully this is making sense. Okay, so how do we do that? So we, remember, we power step the device, Okay, we go from high power to a low power. We then measure the temperature response. It goes from a high to a low temperature. Okay, this is the thermal impedance. Okay, we then convert that to the resistances and capacitances based on this curve. Yeah, this is the thermal impedance curve. And then we do a Foster Cower translation. We go from a ladder model to a Foster Cower resistance capacitance uh, model. And then that creates something called the structure function. Now, you don't need to do any of this manually. The, the, there's hardware available which will do this automatically for you. But uh, at the end of the day, we're, we're reading temperature and extracting a lot of useful information because we're measuring with such fine temperature and time increments that we can create these very fine ladders of thermal resistances and capacitances and ultimately create what we call a structure function which is what we this curve 
is in the, uh, the, the top right. So all this is done, the only thing that the hardware is used for is the actual measurement, and then the software can then convert into a structure function. So what is a structure function? So again, we'll go back to our cross section of our package here, okay? Um, and by the way, you know, if, if you actually wanted to measure the, the semiconductor, which is this uh, square here in the middle, you would actually have to, you know, file this down or use uh, some sort of method to attach a thermocouple to the semiconductor by, by filing away the, the, the epoxy. And that, you know, is destructive testing. It's not going to be representative of the um, the package in real life because you've you've affected it. You've you've changed the amount of uh, material that's that's surrounding the semiconductor. It's going to behave differently. So anyway, uh, that's that's beside the point. Um, so here's our cross section. Okay, here's our different materials. So we have our chip that's made of silicon. Die attached might be some sort of epoxy material. Heat spreader. This is looks like copper. Uh, and then you have the cooling flag. This can be, you know, a cold plate or a heat sink, uh, and that's got some uh, thermal interface material, some sort of tin in there as well. Okay. We know the size of each of the different materials, the length, the width, the height of the different uh, materials, because maybe you've designed this part. Okay. And then we can apply that to the structure function here. So this structure function is thermal resistance versus thermal capacitance. Okay, and at the origin is always, always the actual die, the, 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 the semiconductor. Okay, and because we know the size and the thermal capacitance, we can overlay onto which, which sections of the structure function the different materials are. Okay, so here we have the silicon, die attach, heat spreader, cooling, uh, this will be the thermal interface material, and then uh, the, the, the rest of the, the, the different materials as the heat spreads down, okay? So the structure function can be used to extract this information, understand where the boundaries of the different materials are, and then that allows us to identify where the issues might be or you know, where the heat flow path could be better, where the thermal resistances or capacitances are high or low, and it uh, gives us a lot of insight into the heat flow out of the package. So of course, here at uh, Siemens, we do have a product which uh, performs all of these tasks. It's called the SimCenter Trister T3. There it is again, Transient Thermal Tester. That's what the, uh, the, the three stands for. And it looks something like this. It's a, it's a fairly large, it's about the size of a, uh, uh, maybe a desktop PC something like that. It's uh, designed for lab use. Um, and yeah, it does all of those things that we just talked about from the measurement to uh, the post-processing and the structure function extraction, okay? Very simple and easy to set up. It's only four wires, high power, uh, sorry, high current and low current. Repeatable and um, reproducible, okay? so because we are measuring in such fine time and temperature increments, and we're only talking about conduction, it's very, very repeatable and uh, very, very consistent. Wide variety of different semiconductor components. Uh, we talked about that TO220, but uh, it can be used for high power IGBTs, LEDs, uh, silicon carbides, silicon, gallium nitride, um, any type of semiconductor, any type of packaging, and device type. It gives us insight into the thermal structure, that cross section of different materials and where the boundaries of those different materials are. Fast throughput, depending on what you're wanting to measure, you can do a test uh, in less than one second, okay? If you're just testing the die attached quality, you can do that in, in less than a second, one to five seconds. If you need to fully heat soak the device, excuse me, if, especially if it's very large, then, you know, that can be on the order of, of, you know, 30 minutes to an hour. It really depends on what it is you're trying to test. It's non-destructive. We don't need to, you know, sand anything back or file anything. Uh, it's, it's completely non-destructive and repeatable. We can test components in situ. So, you know, attached to a board, it only needs four wires. 
we can attach and measure devices uh, and the effect of the rest of the environment as well. We can extract thermal models for simulation, so we can interface with FlowTherm. And we can also use it for detailed thermal model calibration. Uh, John touched on this in session number two, uh, and I'll touch on it again a little bit later, but creating much more accurate simulation models by utilizing the structure function. So at this point, Dan, we're gonna ask uh, poll question number two, please. Excellent. Appreciate that great amount of information coming our way. So number two should be in front of everyone. It's a very simple yes or no question. And again, just help us understand where you are and Richard will chime in with explaining what he's seeing in the industry. So have you used physical testing to determine transient response of electronics? Pretty simple. And, and if you don't know how it works at your organization, no issues. Just give us your best guess. There's uh, no wrong answer here. Great. We'll give it just another few seconds. Uh, Richard, we're also seeing a couple of questions come in. I, I don't know if you're seeing those, but um, I'll ask that you will either address them at the end or by email, as I, I know you're uh, going through the presentation right now. Just wanted to give you a heads up. OK, thanks. Great. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and, and close this poll. So just to keep it simple, Richard, I'll share it. About 80% of respondents shared that no, they do not use physical testing for transit thermal response, while 20% said yes. So one out of five, more or less, are, are, are doing it while the others aren't. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll pass it off to you. I don't know if you wanna make a quick comment on that or if you wanted to just jump into the next section. You, yeah, sure. So, I mean, um, you know, if you're using thermocouple testing for transient, uh, you can capture it on the system level, you know, as a as a heat sink heats up over time, you know, you're, you're talking the sort of time scales you're talking about, maybe 10 minutes to an hour to, to be fully become steady state, you can capture that with thermocouples. But if you're talking about within the package close to the semiconductor, then the time scales we're talking about are on, you know, milliseconds, microseconds that are down there. So that you simply can't capture those variances in time with thermocouples. They just don't react quick enough. So you really need an electrical test method to, to capture those very short uh, transients, which, which the Trista can absolutely do. All right, let's, uh, let's move on. So we've talked about how to measure and extract a thermal structure function, but how is that actually used? I mean, it looks nice. It's We understand where the boundaries of the different materials are, but, but what's that actually used for? Well, there's four main points that I'm going to cover and what the various ROIs are, but you know, they, they broadly fall into measurement, degradation, quality, and calibration. Okay, and we'll talk about each of these sections one at a time. Okay, so the first one is the measurement of thermal parameters. So I just talked about the, the, the thermal resistance of, of a package, okay? How can we extract that using a structure function? Well, the JEDEC 51-14 uh, standard goes into something called the dual interface method, okay? So what we do is we take a package like that TO220, okay? We use them and attach them to a cold plate using two different thermal greases. Doesn't matter, one can be good, one can be bad. They can be very, very slightly different, even from different batches. But the structure function, if we overlay them on top of each other, will very clearly show where they deviate. Okay, Where the structure functions change, that's where the edge of the package is. Because the only difference between these two setups is the grease. So where that variation is, that's the edge and that gives you your junction to case or junction to board thermal resistance by overlaying those two structure functions. So in this case, you're talking about maybe 1.7, 1 1.75 1 degrees C per watt is the theta JC in this instance. Okay, and this is very well defined in this uh, JEDEC standard. Okay, so what are the value propositions of measuring a, uh, a junction to case or some sort of um, package thermal metric. 
Well, um, the, the vendor selection, the cost versus benefits, is this package going to work based on its thermal resistance in your electronics product? Yeah? Can you compare them between vendors to see which, which package is going to perform best thermally? Would understanding the thermal performance of more affordable alternative solutions help save time and money? Maybe you're you know, picking a very expensive part with a very low thermal resistance, whereas in reality, you don't need it to be that good. Maybe you can pick something cheaper and it's actually going to perform just as well thermally. Yeah, time to market. So again, if you're spending time measuring thermal resistances or you know, especially with thermocouples, that's going to make the uh, make the design time longer, uh, and you know you're going to get to market slower. So if we can, you know, use those thermal resistances in the design phase much more accurately, then that's going to yield uh, better financial results. Okay, and good thermal metrics can be a selling point. You know, if you can say we have measured our package to exactly to JEDEC 51-14. Um, using the electrical test method, that's that's a very good quality uh, assurance ISO thing to have for your particular package because the the, the setup is very well uh, regulated and understood and and defined, so it can, you can make direct comparisons between um, different package types. Okay, uh, I'm actually going to skip over this one okay so um how is this actually used so for example hitachi in japan they use this um uh the the trista for power module management for their electric vehicles so they were looking for a non-invasive temperature measurement method that was as accurate as conventional thermocouples okay um without having to open up the device, attach a thermocouple, close it again, and then test, because that is, that's actually changing the device, and that might not be giving you a true reading of, of what the actual thermal resistance is. So they wanted to know what the thermal resistance from the semiconductor to the water flow, the theta J W, I guess, in this instance, which would, um, uh, you know, as the heat flows through the semiconductor, the, the substrate, the, the, the heat sink and then into the water and, the, and they can use that comparatively. The Korean Institute of Science and Technology, they were developing a novel graphene copper composite, okay, so uh, for use in LED heat sinks. So whenever you're creating a new material, you need to measure the thermal conductivity Okay, and we can back out the thermal conductivity from the thermal resistance. So the Trista was used to um, power up an LED, attach it to this new material, look at the structure function, extract the part of the structure function that is the heat sink, and then work out the thermal resistance and therefore the thermal conductivity of that new material. And you can change the uh, chemical makeup of that material by altering things and then measuring with the Trista to understand what effect that has on the uh, uh, on the thermal conductivity, and they were seeing around 210 watts per meter Kelvin, which is a uh, which is pretty good. Okay, um, so the second application of the structure function is is reliability. So it's all well and good taking a structure function measurement of a of a device. Um, you know, as soon as it's been manufactured, we can we can see what the structure function is and where the material boundaries are. But how does that change over time? So we can power cycle a device and look at the structure function degradation over time. It allows us to identify where the failures are, and we can do that without having to unmount the device and you know do some sort of destructive testing on that device so we can analyze it as it's running because the structure function we can be extracted at every power cycle compare it to the prior one and then see how it's changing and where okay we can give a lifetime prediction the mean time between failures what value do you place on knowing the reliability of your uh, component up front again coming back to what I was talking about, electric vehicles, got to last for 20 years. 
what's the failure rate? Is it going to last those 20 years? Can defining the proper reliability, me reliability metrics help in selling the product? So is it going to last long enough? Can we guarantee or give a expected lifetime range for this device if it's kept in these this sort of temperature range? You, you can present that data to a customer and they can be much more confident in using your device um, going forwards if you provide that data. So traditionally, if you want to power cycle a device, you need to uh, first of all, de determine what the power cycling uh, criteria are going to be. Okay? You measure it before the power cycling process. You then power cycle it and then return it to a lab for um, to, to cycle it to, to failure. And then they will actually determine the cause of failure. So they will open it up. They will see what's broken, what the issue is. This is very destructive. And uh, you know it's it's also not very consistent because you're attaching and removing the device, you're attaching new grease. It might be slightly different grease from a different batch. So there's a lot of uh, errors introduced in the traditional power cycling uh, process. So the Trista, what we're recommending, uh, oh sorry, the the issues here. Yeah, I've kind of touched on those there, but the how about combining the, the cycling and analysis into a single setup, which is exactly what the Trista does, including the automation. So Dan, um, yeah, I'd like to uh, just put up poll question number three, please. Perfect. So this is our third and final poll question for today. And you should see it in front of you. In this case, there's only one selection, so please just do what you think is, is best and most applicable. And it's as follows, have you encountered any thermal related aging effects of electronics? So the four options are thermal paste dry out. Second is solder join cracking due to fatigue. Third is connector walkout. And four is screen burn in. So again, please pick to the best of your ability or, or understanding. And again, there's also no wrong answer here. So we look forward to it. In addition, I had mentioned, please do continue to ask your questions. We have seen some of them come in already. Uh, and in today's case, we will answer them at the end of the presentation. If we're out of time, we will circle back by email. So please do keep asking your questions and, and somebody, we will be addressing those either at the end or uh, by email afterwards. Great, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and share it in this case. So Richard, it should be in front of you as well. We're seeing 0% with screen burning, which is which is interesting in itself. 64% uh, with solder joint cracking due to fatigue. So so that predominantly there, whereas about a third of the attendees are also seeing thermal paste dry out. So solder joint cracking seems to be the predominant issue. Thermal paste dry out it would be the second largest. A handful with with connector walkout and none with screen burn in. So. Is this what you're seeing or what you typically see in your interactions, Richard? And if you yeah, want to absolutely. Take there. Yeah, I would say thermal paste dry out um, is, is probably the biggest uh, issue with thermal aging. Uh, and then um, solder joint fatigue, um, that only really happens in very high temperature um, cycling applications, you know, when you're going hot, cold, hot, cold constantly, that that's when that happens. But the solder paste dry out, um, that that's the one I see the most. Uh, sorry, the the thermal paste dry out. Okay, moving on. So, what we can do with uh, with the power tester? So you can see three different power testers that we supply uh, here at, at Siemens. This is more of an industrial application. The first Trista that we saw, this is more of a lab environment tester. This power tester can can take devices and it can run for months, even years at a time, to cycle your your devices all the way to failure and monitor those uh, monitor the structure function at every cycle and show you if things are going to fail and where they're going to fail. Um, it's, these are pretty large units. This, this one in the center, this is maybe you know, the size of a washer dryer, two of them side by side. Uh, we have rack mounted solutions. We have standalone smaller solutions that can be wheeled up to vehicles, for example. So um, different 
power testers for different uh, different applications, but the the most the biggest uh, differentiator is the amount of power that it can supply, and also the power cycling capability that the power tester uh, can provide. Okay, broad range of available hardware, wide range of discretes and modules that can be used in this uh, in these power testers. There is dedicated software. There's actually touch screens on all of these devices that sh that, that allow you to set up the device and um, the, the testing parameters. So no PC required if, if it's not needed. Range of power cycling strategies. So you know the the on off times and you know the the frequency of the cycles depending on what you're trying to test and the type of device. We have a range of different power strategies. Short and long duration supports. High precision monitoring, so this comes back to our structure function. Remote monitoring, right? so these are connected to the network, and you know you you can just leave it in the lab, and it can you can check it from from any machine on the network. Minimum user effort, again, still the four wire setup. Safety features, so there are smoke detectors if something burns out or if, or some sort of fire happens. There's there's a lot of safety functionality built into these uh, uh, products because we are dealing with very high power. And then understanding the damage mechanisms, cause and effect. So there are built-in cold plates. The large one that's see, being seen opened here can supply up to 7,200 amps of current to a device. Okay, that, that can cause huge kilowatts of dissipation. Um, and completely automated industrial uh, device for, for power cycling these devices uh, to failure. It says Mentographics there. Mentographics was, uh, was acquired by Siemens about uh, two years ago now, uh, and uh, the, the factory is still actually a Mentographics uh, uh, entity, so that, that branding is still on there. Okay. So um, just a couple of uh, use cases. So on Semiconductor in Belgium, they use uh, the power tester to understand the dye attached degradation over time. Okay, So as you power cycle these devices, the, the, the dye attached, which is a little bit like the uh, thermal interface material, um, can start to develop voids. If there's any gas trapped in the thermal interface material or anything, they don't react too well to temperature changes and voids can start to form. So you can see sample J here in the bottom right. We have a very good coverage of that dye attach. And after some time, that dye attach actually degrades, right, all the way up to sample A, sample B. Uh, and that can be very, very problematic. And that's going to have differences uh, of thermal performance. And we can see that very clearly in the um, in the structure function when we lay the good sample versus the bad sample on top of each other. Yamaha in Japan uh, are moving towards electric vehicles and what they're seeing in their high power motor, motor drives is solder cracking, right? As you power cycle them, then again, hot, cold, hot, cold, you start to see the solder cracking we might still have an electrical con connection, but the thermal aspects are uh, affected by this solder crack. Right? They, we haven't got as much conduction happening through that particular leg. The other ones might be okay, but uh, this particular one is, is not going to be conducting, uh, conducting heat as well. And again, we can see that very clearly by overlaying the structure functions on top of each other. Okay, the third aspect, uh, thermal quality. So we can analyze uh, a component and do a, a during the manufacturing process and do quality assurance to, ins uh, to ensure that the, the device is up to spec, right? We can identify manufacturing defects. So we can uh, create consistent quality measurements of devices as they're produced. Do your customers require that thermal information and require it to be within a certain window, plus or minus, say, 0.1 degrees C per watt? How do you ensure the production quality? Do you need to bin and sort your devices? And do you have batch variances? 
right? So all of this can be answered by measuring the thermal resistance of your package using that dual interface test method. method. Okay, um, so here, for example, you have this die attached with maybe some manufacturing errors with those voids in like we saw with, with on semi, and then by overlaying the structure functions, you can see where the issue is and it suggests die attach voids because we, we, we know where in the structure function the different materials are as the heat flows through that device. So this is kind of, you know, we're taking a gold reference, uh, an, a known good device, and then comparing manufactured devices to that gold reference. Yeah. And we do have automated let me just play this video, if it will play. Nope, hold on. Why won't it play? Apologies. Ah, there we go. Okay, so we do have automated uh, test methodology. So we are working on a Trista, which can actually do inline testing. So this uh, incorporates some sort of robotic arm. It still has the touch screen, and then it can actually bin devices based on their thermal resistance and structure function. So the arm can take a device from uh, a manufacturing line, it can place it on a customized test setup, apply a consistent pressure, and you can see the actual test took less than a second, and then based on the structure function, it can then bin that device, good, medium, bad, and then you can, you know, use this in quality assurance. So in terms of the software, you can see the touch screen here, setting up a MOSFET. Um, we can define what the temperature, current, and voltage uh, criteria are for this particular device. Okay, um, And then the actual die attach measurement, which we're doing in this case, is very quick, less than a second. So we're just defining some of the properties for, uh, you know, what the, the good, the medium, and the bad criteria are. Okay, so if we have a look at it again, it picks up the device, takes it over to a standard testing PCB. In this case, there's only, there's only four wires needed. Yeah, you can see them, the ones in the background are, are um, too important. Power up the device, force the contact, do a structure function measurement, a transient measurement, good, medium, or bad, and then we can bin our devices in that way. So we can create these customized setups for you if you require. Okay, so the actual die attach measurement, right? We have a good and a poor die attach. That's actually measured in, uh, yeah, point one second. Actually, yeah, we we only need to test it for point one second. And as your as you zoom away from the semiconductor device, the, the the testing times will get longer and longer. But in this case, very very quick. So high throughput. The the slowest part of that is actually the robotic arm moving the component to the uh, to the testing apparatus. And then finally, uh, simulation calibration. So John, John touched on this in session number two, but how do you know if your simulation models are any good? Right? The, the materials that you selected, the contact resistances between those materials, um, you're, you're taking a guess on a lot of those things. So if we can take physical test measurement to calibrate our simulation model, that's gonna give us a much better simulation model for use further down the line. Okay. So do you verify the quality and accuracy of your thermal models? Do you want to avoid over or under designing your products? If, if your materials and resistances aren't right, then the rest of the system might not be right. Have you considered the accuracy of the transient behavior? Okay, so the steps for calibration are, you need to measure the device, you need to then create a 3D model of that device in, say, uh, for SimCenter FlowTherm. Okay, we then measure multiple channels on this device. This is an IGBT module for uh, ele uh, electric vehicle, for example. We can then extract the measured structure function 
and the flow therm structure function, because you can use flow therm to create a structure function as well, overlay them on top of each other, and then vary, say, materials and contact resistances until those two curves match up perfectly, which, which they do in this instance. And then you can be very, very confident that the thermal simulation model that you've created has, you know, has a very good steady state and transient response. Okay? And you can then provide that to your customer and say, hey, Mr. Customer, this is, this is a uh, Trista calibrated model. It's very, very accurate. Please use it in the rest of your thermal design. Yeah, so if it's uncalibrated, the thermal response will be different. You have the uh, experimental structure function versus the uh, assumed flow therm structure function. And then once we're calibrated, it's going to match much better. And, you know, from, divide, uh, from the actual semiconductor all the way out to the case. Yeah, it doesn't use thermocouple, um, so we're not affecting the package in any way. And then we can be very confident that everything is uh, very, very accurate. And especially if you're using things in a transient simulation. Okay, so when you use flow therm for a transient, say you're doing a drive cycle of a vehicle, then it's very important that you have an accurate model for use in that drive cycle. Yeah. And then Huawei in uh, China, they use uh, this calibration methodology to provide very, very accurate models, uh, SOC models for uh, mobile devices. Okay, and those are used by you know, vendors further down the line. Okay, um, to summarize, uh, and sort of some of the key highlights of uh, thermal transient testing, it really gives us transient thermal insight, okay? Not just steady state, but the transients, the very, very fine time and temperature measurements right at the start of the transient, we can extract a lot of information uh, about the performance of your device by measuring with, with very fine uh, fidelity there. Um, thermal quality assurance, okay? We saw uh, binning of the devices, ensuring that there isn't too much variation in your batches uh, and the, each of your devices is going to perform uh, within spec of each other. We can understand and reduce thermal failures, especially when it comes to power cycling. So if, if that semiconductor is going to last 20 years in your Tesla, then we need to understand as it degrades, how much does it degrade, what are the main failure modes, and can those be, uh, can the design be changed to address those? And then quantifiable the thermal metrics that we can extract from measurement, used for comparison or um, further use in simulation down the line, as we saw with calibration as well. So wide range of different things that the uh, the uh, structure function can be used for, um, and yeah, it's, uh, overall it's a really nice complement to to some of the simulation that that many of you might be doing. With that, um, that, that kind of concludes my, my session on thermal test. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll have a look at some of the questions that uh, are, uh, have come up. Wonderful, great conclusion and presentation as usual, Richard. Thank you for that. Yeah, we've had a number of questions coming up. Uh, you're probably scanning through them. I'll, I'll ask one, uh, you may be able to, to jump into right away and then we'll, we'll jump to some of the others. So, could you please explain again how a one-point measurement gives a cross-component structure function? Is this something you can jump into, Richard? Uh, sorry, can you just repeat that question again, please? Definitely. Could you please explain how a one-point measurement gives a cross-component structure function? Right. So when we power up a, uh, a semiconductor device, we're actually um, activating the entire uh, sort of active area of, of the device. So we're, we're not powering on individual transistors with on the semiconductor. We're, we're using the body diode. If, if that semiconductor has been manufacturing you, if it's a CMOS device, 
then we can use the body, body diode to uniformly heat up the, the active surface of that semiconductor. Now, as the heat spreads down, um, we are only measuring the, the, the semiconductor temperature change versus time. So it, we, we don't see the spreading um, sort of in 3D. It is assumed to be like a 1D heat conduction um, mechanism as, as, as the heat goes through the device. So it's a little bit difficult to explain without uh, additional slides. Um, maybe I can kind of send a, um, I've, got a, I've got a white paper that explains exactly how this is done. Uh, I can definitely send that afterwards. Perfect. I think that would be great. And we'll, we'll take that offline to just get into more details and if we've set up a follow-up uh, discussion on that, we can look to do that too. Great. Richard, can you can you see the other questions? Are they showing up for you, or do you need me to read them out? Uh, no, I can see those now. Um, so, uh, how does this compare to temperature reported in software on Intel chip, for example? Right. So, an Intel chip will have um, multiple temperature sensing diodes built in to uh, built into the the actual um, layout of the transistors when it was designed. Um, and it can report multiple different temperatures. But again, the Trista, what it will do is it will, it will uniformly heat up the semiconductor. So there will only be one junction temperature. Whereas in reality, when it's actually operating, the, there will be a temperature variation on the surface of the, uh, the semiconductor. But uh, when we do a Trista measurement, we, can, uh, we, we just have that single junction temperature. Now, what we can do is calibrate an Intel thermal flow therm model, okay, and then apply non-uniform heat sources on the uh, the surface of the silicon. So then you would see um, hot spots on the on the silicon, for example. All right, uh, next question. How do you decide on how to segment the curve of the structure function? That's interesting. Okay, so the way we segment it is if if we look at the gradients in the structure function, when they change very rapidly, that's a very good indicator of, um, of a different material being encountered. Okay. Um, another way is if we know what the physical dimensions of uh, a material are, right? say the diatach or the silicon, then we can overlay that onto the structure function because we know what the extent of the thermal resistance and capacitance is, so we know where the, the edge of that material is. So there's a few different ways that we can kind of understand where the, the, the different materials, uh, how the heat changes as it goes, uh, sorry, how the temperature changes as it goes through different materials. Okay, to overlay the component areas to R versus C graph, do you need to know the detailed construction of the device? Um, it's helpful, again, for knowing the physical dimensions, but it's not 100% necessary. Uh, again, we can show um, differential and integral versions of the structure function, and that will show us where those gradients of the structure function change, and that's, a very, and that's normally a very good indicator of uh, where those different materials are. Uh, is Trista owned by Siemens, and how does it compare to JEDI? Uh, I'm not sure what JEDI is, um, but Trista was developed there, there by... Was a cor Sorry, Richard, there's a correction on that. It, it's it's uh, compared to JEDEC. J E D E C. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah. So JEDEC is the uh, Joint Electron Development Someone Council. I, I can't remember the exact acronym for JEDEC, but that, that, that that's actually a uh, an industry standardizing body. Um, but the Trister is actually a it's a commercial product. It was originally developed by a company called Micred in Hungary. That was acquired by uh, Flomerix in the UK. I used to work for Flomerix. Flomerix was acquired by Menta Graphics, and then about three years ago, Menta Graphics was acquired by Siemens. So yeah, to answer the question, yes, Trista and the, the, the technology and the patents associated with Micred are, are all owned by uh, Siemens now, Siemens Digital Industry Software. 
Uh, okay. Uh, could you please explain again how a one-point measurement gives a cross-component yeah. structure that was, function? That was the one I started with, Richard. So what okay. we could do is we can, yeah, we'll send more of the white paper and additional details um, to the person who asked that a bit later. Sure, yeah. It's essentially, you know, we're only measuring the semiconductor temperature versus time, but how it changes with time depends on what what the what the surrounding materials are so yeah I, i'll send the white paper to you dan and um we can uh, that, that goes over in in a lot of detail wonderful great i think i think that's it if you have more questions uh, to the audience attendees please do let us know i think the rest have been addressed via the chat and question function richard did you have any other slides that are here that you wanted to go over Yeah, excellent. This is the one I wanted to speak to. So uh, to all the attendees, again, thank you so much for being with us. I think majority of you have been here throughout the four sessions, but uh, some of you may have come in and out. So we will make all of these available. And if you have questions as you go through them, please don't hesitate to reach out on, on any of those function areas. In addition, we had made the link available to, to download and, and evaluate Flowtherm XT. Um, we will reshare that link. I know a number of you have already started trying it, and we're seeing questions come in there. So please don't hesitate to reach out um, as you as you'd like to learn more. And again, if if you want more information on any of this, or you'd like to do a deeper dive, or you want to even set up a a discussion on how this will relate to to your current engineering processes and workflows, please do send us a, a note there. I'd, I'd like to once again thank all of our our presenters uh, that have helped out, Richard in particular, for getting this. It was a great session and the others, uh, John, who, who is in with us here today, uh, Mario and, and Yafis. So I'd like to thank the whole team that put this together. And for all the attendees, thank you for joining us on a weekly basis. Please be on the lookout as we will have more content coming up. Um, you will also be receiving a certificate for your attendance to this series. Uh, if you have any issues there, please send us a note as well. Um, feel free to share it on social media. Let people know if you like the sessions, you know, uh, show off your, your certificate and the extra knowledge you have. And as you can see on the screen, we do have additional webinars and series like these that are going on. If there are other topics that you're interested in that we aren't covering here or we haven't covered an upcoming webinar, please don't hesitate to, to recommend it or, or say, hey, I'd love to learn more about you know certain subject or certain industry relevance, and we'll aim to put something together. So with that, we are wrapping up the session in the series. Once again, thank you so much. And uh, we will send out the follow-up materials as we've been doing uh, prior to the end of this week. So thank you all. Have a great day.